Uh, good evening, everyone, uh, to the people who are present here today and the people who would be joining us. Uh, my name is Akriti Tripathi. I am a um, co-instructor and assisting Dr. Popovsky, uh, who's our lead instructor in the course UN, uh, the Law and Practice of the United Nations. And uh, the Wednesday lecture series has been a very successful student-run initiative uh, with the Jinder Society of International Law, Kurtzi Ankit, and a very dedicated group of students, and also Dr. Popovsky, where we've had a wide variety of speakers uh, enlightening us and educating us on uh, burning issues of international law. And we were very lucky to have with us Professor John Duggard also, who uh, enlightened and, you know, threw light upon a very effective enforcement mechanism required on international law. Keeping a similar vein, we have today with us Professor Gentian, who will be talking about uh, the International Court of Justice and its role in uh, framing and formulating uh, human rights. And as a quick warm up, as I always say, I'd just like to put across a brief bio uh, of Professor Gentian before us for the audience. Uh, that he is a professor of international law and human rights at the Norwegian Center for Human Rights at the University of Oslo. And currently he's heading the department. And uh, uh, professor comes with a very uh, strong combination of academic work as well as practice of international law, which is very clearly proven because he was involved in a case before the ICJ. And he's also worked uh, for the defense at the International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia in two cases with multiple def defendants. So that really shows the in-depth exposure that professor has had. And currently... He is a member of the UN Human Rights Committee from 2019 to 22. And during the last 17 years, Professor Zyberi has researched, published, taught on various areas of public international law and written extensively on the practice of the ICJ. Uh, Professor, it's an honor and a pleasure to have you with us today. And we're really looking forward to your lecture. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Professor Tripathi, for your kind introduction, your kind words. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be with you here uh, today. And I want to commend uh, Mr. Malhotra and the Jindal Society of International Law for the invitation and for their initiative in putting together this lecture series. And I am honored to be a part of this and to share with you some thoughts today. Uh, but before I start with sharing my uh, slides and what I want to talk uh, to you today, I just want to uh, express my sympathies to, to you, to the people of India for the very difficult situation with the pandemic and to express my hope and desire that this uh, difficult situation for, for many people will start improving soon and that not as many will be uh, affected. Uh, with those words, I want to uh, start sharing then my slides. Today I'll be speaking about the role and contribution of the International Court of Justice in developing international human rights law. And this is, of course, a, a very broad topic, and I will be speaking for about uh, 35, 40 minutes, and then we'll have a, a Q&A, we'll have a, a dialogue. But I have structured this presentation by starting first with a brief introduction of the International Court of Justice. Uh, there are many international courts these days. It's not so difficult to um, also... Uh, mix them because there are quite a few have been uh, based in The Hague. I will speak about the International Court of Justice institutional possibilities and limitations just to provide the context in which the court operates and the context of which it engages with international human rights law. And then I'll provide some examples on how the court has contributed to developing and interpreting international human rights law. And I use acronyms, of course, we're all used to that. I'll provide also, towards the end, a few recommendations as to how the court's work can be improved and some concluding remarks. So what is the International Court of Justice and what does it do? 
Well, the ICJ is one of the main organs of the United Nations, as you would know, and its principal judicial organ. It has a dual function within the UN, so its jurisdiction has both a contentious and an advisory function. So the court settles interstate disputes, but also gives advisory opinions on legal questions to the UN's main organs and duly authorized organs and agencies. And here I should say that the, it's the General Assembly of the UN that has requested most of the advisory opinions and the Security Council a few, and also the ICJ has never rejected to give an opinion requested by the General Assembly, and I doubt that it, will, it, 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 it ever will, most likely. What about the court itself? Who are the judges? Well, the court is uh, composed of 15 judges elected for a nine-year term by the UN General Assembly Security Council sitting independently of each other. You will most likely know that Judge Bandari of India is part of the court. And, um, well, there is an unwritten rule that uh, the five permanent members usually would have a judge sitting in the International Court of Justice. In terms of what law the court applies, you would know, of course, as students of international law, that uh, the sources of international law themselves are enumerated. It's not maybe an exhaustive list, but it is the authoritative list in Article 38 of the ICJ statute that the court applies treaties, customer international law, general principles of law, and then as subsidiary means judicial decisions and scholarly writing. There has been a lot of work on the part of the International Law Commission, which is the subsidiary body of the General Assembly, entrusted with the codification and progressive development of international law on a number of these issues, especially quite a bit of work now more recently, in more recent times, concerning the sources of international law that might be quite interesting for you as students of, of international law, especially probably the work on the identification of customer international law and also the work on Hughes-Cogan's norms. What are some of the possibilities and limitations of the court? Well, first of all, the court, uh, there's only states primarily that have access to its contentious jurisdiction. It's only states that have access to its contentious jurisdiction. And then in terms of advisory opinions, we have the UN main organs that can ask any question any legal question that they want, and the specialized agencies can ask questions within their sphere of activities. The advisory opinions are not binding, legally speaking, but of course, they come with the weight of um, the principal judicial organ of the UN. So that is, in a sense, an interpretive, interpretative, uh, authoritative interpretation of international law. There is probably a general perception of the court as a conservative judicial body, uh, and that might uh, be something which we can also discuss later on. States are hesitant, generally speaking, to bring cases and to argue cases in pure human rights terms. And here we have to see that development of international law, of international adjudication, international courts and tribunals, because over time, from 1946-47, it's been 75 years for the ICJ now, uh, while the ICJ was one of the few courts that was there at the beginning, by now we have a lot of other international courts and tribunals, and also we have regional human, ro human rights uh, courts and UN treaty bodies and so on. So the field of specialized bodies dealing with human rights has increased significantly. Hence, if you want, uh, the court is operating on a, on a field that is quite, um, that has quite a few institutional mechanisms. What is another jurisdictional challenge, if you want, for the court to be involved in more cases, 
is the general lack of compromise, so-called compromisory clauses in human rights and humanitarian law, international humanitarian law treaties, which basically means that it is quite difficult to seize the court. And I'll get back to this in the next slide. Additionally, only 74 states out of the 193 UN member states have accepted the so-called compulsory jurisdiction of the court under Article 36.2. And if you go to the website of the court, it's, uh, by the way, a very good website. You will have access to a lot of materials. You'll have access to the judgments. There are summaries prepared by the registry. So I think it's indeed a wonderful resource for students of international law to look at the original uh, documents at the ICJ's website and also to use the search engine of the, of, the, of the court's website, which is functioning much better than a few years ago when I was studying the court and writing my own PhD. So moving on to the compromisory clauses then, from the nine so-called major or core human rights treaties, only five of them include a compromisory clause. That is the Convention on Elimination of Racial Discrimination, the Convention on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, Convention Against Torture, Convention on Migrant Workers, and Convention on Elimination of Enforced Disappearances. Then we have also the Genocide Convention, which includes such a compromisory clause. And to make things a little bit more complicated, we have different types of these compromisory clauses. So while the Genocide Convention, or on the basis of this article, you could potentially directly seize the court for some of the other compromisory clauses, you would have access to the ICJ only after negotiation with the other country, or you would have access after negotiation and a six month period where the countries will try to get their dispute to international arbitration. Here I want to add another, a few more words since I am at the compromisory clauses. So there have been a few cases that have been brought on the basis of these compromisory clauses. And I want to add here that because of the lack of these compromisory clauses in the two general international covenants on civil and political rights and on economic, social and cultural rights, the cases brought before the court um, Well, let's put it that way. While the core, the substance of the dispute is about serious human rights violations, it does not really fit under that particular convention, under that particular international treaty. So there have been some cases brought under the genocide convention, let's say, that, or at least one, where probably, where had there been had there been compromisory clauses uh, under IHL treaties, that would have been a lot more appropriate because these were serious violations of human rights and humanitarian law, but maybe not amounting to necessarily to genocide. Same goes for the Convention on Elimination of Racial Discrimination. So there were serious human rights violations being committed in some of the cases brought before the court uh, under that treaty, but these violations do not really necessarily neatly fit under that particular convention. So that's just for you to keep in mind. It's almost like trying to uh, fit a camel through a needle's eye, as one colleague has put it. Now, if I move on to the substantive part, how the ICJ has contributed to human rights. Well, let me, let me start first with the cases. With Instead of starting with the qualitative part, let me start with the quantitative part, if you want, right? Um, so from the start of the work of the court, you have it here from 22nd of May, 1947 to the 5th of March, 2021, that we have the data in the ICJ's website. We have 179 cases entered in the general list. And then from these, about 12 advisory opinions and 35 contentious cases, maybe slightly more. 
relate to human rights? Well, what does it tell us? It tells us that between one fourth to one third of the cases brought before the ICJ relate to human rights, which is, if you want, a considerable amount of cases. And if I go one step further, a lot of cases relate or a lot of cases brought before the ICJ, although they might not have moved further, relate to diplomatic protection and to the protection of individuals. So they would have a human right component uh, involved. Then moving on to uh, in, the, in the chapter that I have circulated, I try to speak about the three stages that a case goes through uh, before, before the court. I'm speaking here about contentious cases. That's the preliminary objections phase, the merits uh, phase, and the reparations phase. And of course, for advisory opinions, that's not uh, that is not the case. And I have also spoken about um, looking at the court as an institution from different angles, from a procedural angle, from a substantive angle, and from an institutional angle. And I would like you to keep these different angles in mind, also in terms of thinking more generally, not only about the activity of the court, uh, but also about international law more generally. The court has addressed a number of cases which are related directly to human rights, some of them maybe somewhat implicitly, and has also shed light on important aspects of human rights. And I'm going to move on then to giving, or I will start first with cases which concern what I would term as community interests or issues of a general interest for the whole of the international community. And there are four types of issues that have been brought before the court that would enter into this kind of a category of community interests. The first revolves around the issue of reservations to human rights treaties or the scope of, of, of allowable reservations to human rights treaties. And that goes, of course, to the one of the very first advisory opinions by the uh, ICJ on reservations to the Genocide Convention of 1951. Then, of course, the, the ICJ has played an important role in the process of decolonization, which started, well, it started, if you want, it was included in the UN Charter from 1945, but I think it, it, it really started and it sped up from 1960s onwards with the UN General Assembly Declaration on Decolonization. Here we have a number of cases advisory opinions, primarily asked by the General Assembly and Security Council, which related to this process, which is, of course, related to community interests and to the rights of peoples to self-determination. Then there are two other types of cases that have been brought before the ICJ. The issue of nuclear disarmament and the ban on nuclear weapons. We have an advisory opinion of 1996. We have the cases brought by the Marshall Islands against a number of states. Um, and the last part here concerning community interests broadly understood is the obligation to prosecute or extradite to ensure accountability for serious human rights violations. And we have a number of cases and I'm going to address you to them in a moment. In the chapter which is related to this seminar, I speak about the development of international human rights law and the contribution of the court to that as divided in three stages. In the first stage, the court is trying to or is using mainly customer international law and general principles of international law because there's also not so many human rights treaties to start with. We have the first, the Convention on Elimination of Racial Discrimination in 1965 and then the two international covenants in 1966. So we have that period of standard setting, if you want. So in that first starting period from 1947, 
to, if you want, uh, 1970. The court is looking into custom international law and general prism international law and drawing from them and also internationalizing the protection of human rights by basically acknowledging the UN's important role in monitoring the human rights situation in different countries. So human rights violations were not to be seen then as just a domestic matter for states, but something that the UN organs, the UN General Assembly, others could look into. And this is written then in the interpretation of the peace treaties is an advisory opinion already from 1950 with two phases. The court starts by using and then giving some more substance to some general principles, fundamental principles of international human rights law that are very important. The first one is that of elementary considerations of humanity. And if you want, this would be interesting for students of international law because if you want these elementary considerations of humanity is something which is used also uh, in the Martin's clause, the principles of humanity. And um, it is very important because it if you want, combines natural law and positive law, or I would say that it lies at that particular intersection, if you want. But uh, that is probably a little bit my, my own take on that. And I have to say that with the development then of treaty law and customer international law, this part of elementary considerations of humanity has been grounded clearly in positive law. Then we have, so this is something which the court starts in the court for channel case and then it uses in the Nicaragua cases, uh, the case on the merits in 1986, quite a few decades later. Then we have this very important concept of obligations erga omnes, which the court uses in the very famous Barcelona traction case in 1970 where the court says these obligations ergo omnes or obligations of states vis-a-vis -vis the other uh, members of the international community, other states, derive from outlawing of acts of aggression and of genocide and principles and rules concerning the basic rights of the human person, including protection from slavery and racial discrimination. And I want to highlight here that if you want, by 1970 then, by and large, the Convention Against Slavery and the Convention on Elimination of Racial Discrimination had already been in place and they had been adopted by many countries. So it's not that the ICJ is mentioning them by chance, if you want. So the ICJ is highlighting the law and the development of international human rights law, if you want, at that particular moment in time. I spoke about the elementary considerations of humanity, and then I said that they were given a little bit more substance, being anchored then in common article three to the Geneva Conventions of 1949. If I move on to some topical issues that might be quite interesting also to write papers on. Um, the right of people to self-determination. We have a number of cases that I have listed here, which engage with this right. And President Higgins, Judge Higgins, uh, the British judge at the International Court of Justice, she has written about the contribution of the ICJ to human rights, so has Judge Bruno Sima, so have uh, other judges and of course scholars of, of international law. I cannot mention all of them here, but Higgins points out the fact that the International Court of Justice gave legal cover to what for many states was, if you want, a political aspiration, this right of people to self-determination, although it is, of course, included in the UN Charter and the two international covenants, Article 1 of both covenants. But we have the Southwest Africa cases uh, lasting for over two decades related to the decolonization and the self-determination of Namibia, then Southwest Africa, 
a process which was eventually completed in 1990. And that had to do, of course, also with the fact that South Africa was an apartheid state until very long, uh, until 1994 then. Uh, but several cases here concern the right of people to self-determination, which help, if you want, also interpret different resolutions of the UN General Assembly and activity by both the General Assembly and Security Council in this field. We have the Western Sahara advisory opinion. We have a case on East Timor. There were two cases, uh, contentious cases, Ethiopia and Liberia versus um, South Africa. Then we have the case, or the advisory opinion, sorry, about the uh, legality of the construction of a wall in the occupied Palestinian territory. And the latest one is the Chagos Archipelago. So a lot of interesting cases to, to look at and to see how the court has engaged with the rights of people's self-determination. In the context of decolonization, I have to emphasize, now in more recent years, I would tend to think that um, although probably the process of decolonization, uh, there are a number of non-self-governing territories still, but that process have, has largely been completed, at least formally. But in any event, uh, there, the, the, the cases now that might be brought before the court on this might have to do with secession matters, but uh, most likely not so much anymore with the uh, decolonization. Then we'll have to see how the court will respond to these other types of forms or of, of exercise of people to self-determination. Then I move on to the prohibition of genocide, where the court has rendered, I think, a very good contribution to developing the standards for state conduct and also for developing the law and international responsibility concerning the prevention and the punishment of the crime of genocide. We have the reservations to the Genocide Convention from the very beginning, a very important advisory opinion when it comes to the development of the law of the treaties, and the International Law Commission has used these cases and other case law of the ICJ to develop the Vienna Convention of Law of the Treaties that would be, of course, very well known to you. The object and purpose test, if you want, is uh, developed quite considerably in this advisory opinion. Then we have three cases which are con uh, concerned with application of the Genocide Convention. Uh, one between Bosnia and Herzegovina and Serbia and Montenegro, the other one between Croatia and Serbia and Montenegro, and the last one which is ongoing is between uh, Gambia and Myanmar concerning the genocide against the Rohingya people. I can go on and you, we would need many seminars to cover all of the substantive aspects of this. So I urge you to have a, a close look at the cases themselves, if you want, or at least read the summaries prepared by the registry. That would be very interesting because the court has rendered important contribution to the development of human rights on this field by defining the group the protected groups by emphasizing the fact that states need to take steps to punish, to prevent and to punish genocide. They have a duty to cooperate then with international courts and tribunals that have been established to, um, to punish the crime, to, to punish, to investigate and prosecute uh, perpetrators of the crime of genocide and so on. We have a few cases concerning the right to asylum here. I'm not going to say a whole lot, but the right to asylum, especially to political asylum, has been very important. It's still quite important uh, in the world. And we have a few cases that are relating to this particular right. We have a lot of cases which concern diplomatic and consular protection, starting from the Notabom case in 1955, moving on to the Tehran hostages case. And the most recent case is the Dialo case decided in 2012. And I'm going to say a little bit more maybe about the Dialo case and some other cases 
when it comes to the issue of reparations for human rights violations, because they are very important cases. There is a group of what I refer to as consular relation disputes from Brert, Lagrand, Aven, and other Mexican nationals, and the Jadav case, which will be, of course, quite uh, well known to you, because the last case uh, involves a case between India and Pakistan. But what is important here is that the Consular Relations Convention includes a protection under third, uh, Article 36 in terms of creating the right of a national to liaise with the consular uh, office in a country and to meet with them and also to have the benefit of it, his or her own country to help them with uh, legal defense in cases in which they are involved. And I also have to add here that a lot of these cases, previous cases from Brad, Lagrand, Aven, and other Mexican nationals which are concerned with the US, these are death row cases where states were involved because their nationals were sitting on death row and waiting to be executed. And in fact, many of them, in fact, were. About the Jadav case, I think uh, you have most likely read the, the, the decision in quite some detail. We can discuss that later. An important contribution of the court, an institutional contribution, is the care shown by the court to protect human rights rapporteurs, human rights experts that are involved in human rights work from interference by their own states or other states in their work, in fulfilling their mandate. And we have these two advisory opinions. I refer to by the names of the human rights rapporteurs, human rights experts involved, the Mazilu and the Kumarasvami cases, uh, two advisory opinions of 1989 and 1999. I think very important because there the court explains the immunity that attaches to these UN human rights rapporteurs while they are on duty. I think this is still very important um, institutionally for ensuring that these human rights rapporteurs can carry out their work unhindered. There are two important issues which relate, or if you want, are related to the relationship between human rights and two other important fields, international humanitarian law and international criminal law. And here we're speaking first about the relation between human rights and humanitarian law in armed conflict situations, but also in other situations. And here the court has basically, well, I think it has uh, by and large stated what might have been obvious, but also stating the obvious sometimes it's very important especially when that comes from the court, because that will uh, ensure that there are no questions or hesitations or doubts about that particular interaction. And the court has said some matters might be only for human rights, some matters might be a matter for international material law, and some, uh, some situations might be a matter where both of these two branches of public international law would apply. And in fact, this third scenario is the most uh, more recurring scenario, if you want. And the court has said that much in a number of uh, cases. We have the two advisory opinions of 1996 and 2004. And then we have the armed activities case judgment of December 2005 between the DRC and Uganda which is now at the reparations phase actually. And uh, if you are interested, I actually strongly encourage you to, to take a, a look at that case. When it comes to individual criminal responsibility for international recognized crimes and uh, pursuing accountability for serious violations, we have a number of cases that are relevant here and I have included them. And here is not only the relationship between, if you want, 
human rights, international criminal law, but also the law on immunities becomes also very, very important. Another important sub part, if you want, of that relation between human rights and humanitarian law and, and public international law more generally relates to IHL's part and the public international law part on the prohibition of illegal exploitation of natural resources in the context of military occupation. And this is again the armed activities case. And the court has also provided some guidance on principles of delivering humanitarian assistance, especially in the in the Nicaragua case between Nicaragua and the US in the merits part in 1986. Now, if I look at the contribution of the court, then from a bird eyes view, then the court has helped to interpret and develop certain gray areas of international human rights law, its interaction or relationship with other branches of public international law, related branches of public international law like international humanitarian law and international criminal law. The court hasn't always provided groundbreaking findings. I think some of the findings concerning the duty on states concerning the prevention of genocide and some other findings concerning the implementation of the convention against genocide. I think they are, in fact, there are a number of some, uh, I'm going to say groundbreaking, perhaps even groundbreaking important findings there. But the court has given its judicial imprimatur to stamp to certain accepted or existing interpretations including also the extraterritorial application of human rights treaties, application of human rights uh, treaties and obligations in armed conflicts and so on. Here I also want to emphasize that the court has used work done by other parts of the UN, uh, fact-finding missions, the work of peacekeeping troops like MONUSCO in uh, gathering information concerning potential violations of human rights humanitarian law, it has used findings by the UN Human Rights Committee, the Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, others to further substantiate its findings, its legal findings. I think that is quite important. Uh, it's, it's something which goes into the development of international law and keeping the fabric of international law together, a point to which I will get back um, at the end of this presentation. What the court has done more generally then, I haven't spoken a lot about provisional measures orders, which are very important, especially in an armed conflict. But during these incidental proceedings, the court has urged state or has ordered states, if you want, to ensure compliance with human rights and humanitarian law obligations to refrain from recognizing or assisting in maintaining a legal situation, not to aggravate the dispute. So that is also important, an important contribution to national peace and security, and also to provide reparations for violations of international law. Here, I just want to add two more words concerning the issue of reparations uh, that I have developed in the chapter. I cannot develop them a lot, but I just need to add that in the corporate channel case, in the advisory opinion on the wall built in the occupied Palestinian territory, the dialogue case, and now more recently in the armed activities case, in the ongoing proceedings to determine reparations in the case between the DRC and Uganda, the court renders an important contribution to clarifying these principles of reparations for violations of international law. And what is very important here is that the court also keeps an eye on the fact that reparations for these violations should also go to the individuals affected. So it's not only for the states. So this is something to train the attention of the states in terms of what these reparations are about also to a large extent. Then of course, the institutional features of the ICJ uh, has have helped uh, in setting up other international judicial bodies. Why? Because of the composition of the court, because of its rules of procedure, 
because of that institutional experience has been used in setting up other judicial bodies. We can speak about uh, both a domestic and international impact of the ICJ's case law. Uh, at the international impact, I would tend to think that uh, strengthening the rule of law at international level and emphasizing also through the procedures before the court, this equality, sovereign equality of states, um, no matter whether they are large or small, I think it's an important to signal to signal that. Um, a few recommendations and some concluding remarks, because I see the time time uh, runs really fast. Some recommendations in terms of if you want improving the interaction between the court and other important organs for the interpretation or the application of international human rights law, public international law more generally. Uh, more attention might need to be given to the relationship between the ICJ and other tribunals. There is no strict hierarchy, but I think if other courts are dealing with matters primarily of public international law, then probably the court would be maybe better suited to give an advisory opinion on those matters. The Human Rights Council, if the Human Rights Council had an opportunity to bring requests for advisory opinions from the court, that might probably be uh, an interesting, important development. Same goes for giving access to Secretary General of the United Nations, other international regional bodies within their spheres of activity. I think that would help in well, in reducing the risk, if you want, of fragmentation of international law and contradictory interpretations. Of course, that would mean that the court would have a lot more work and it's, of course, not so easy than for the court, maybe if there were too many cases suddenly brought before the court. Another idea that I have aired um, is creating a human rights and humanitarian issues chamber at the ICJ that can deal with these issues more speedily. Some of the cases brought before the ICJ have been pending before they have been finally resolved for 15 years or more. And that has to do, of course, with the procedures before the court and so on. And they are not due to the court necessarily, but to the states taking their time to submit their, their submissions, written and so on. Or to use the chamber of summary procedure for some of these cases, because we cannot have the serious violations of human rights and humanitarian law can go on for a long period of time without necessarily being addressed. So in a sense, um, making international justice a little bit more effective, a little bit more speedy would be, I think, quite important. Adding a compromisory clause to human rights treaties that do not have one. I mean, some of these recommendations, I understand that they are quite uh, ambitious and probably they might be in the realm of the impossible, but I think it's important to think the thought first. And the UN General Assembly would have to continue to encourage states to accept the compulsory jurisdiction of the court. I mean, we have about one third of the states that have accepted the compulsory jurisdiction, I said 74 out of 193, and it's important to increase that number. Then the gender balance. I haven't said much about it, but it is extremely important. We have 15 judges at the ICJ. Right now, I think we have only three female judges. This is something which um, we have to address and we have to address. I mean, the time for addressing this was yesterday or many days before. So states will need to pay close attention to this. And then we have some positive examples from the UK, US, China and Uganda. I hope other countries will follow suit. And some concluding remarks. Judge Seema has pointed out that by keeping the fabric of international law together, the ICJ helps ensure a better interaction between human rights and other branches of international law, and also streamlines and mainstreams uh, human rights into public, in, into the broader corpus of public international law. Very important. I think an important conclusion here is the ICJ has been able to vet if you want the uh, international law, which is made primarily by states and then for states, 
uh, although uh, we have developed quite a bit on that in that regard as well. But to, to vet that with demands for the promotion of respect for individual human rights and uh, human life and dignity. And some of these consular relations cases and diplomatic protection cases, I think they are a testament to that. And also the ICJ, while it serves states and uh, international organizations, has not lost sight of the fact that individuals are the final recipients of uh, the, the, the rights accruing to them under public international law. I will share the slides. I have uh, included at the end some of my own work on the ICJ. I've been studying the ICJ since 2003, so that is probably about uh, 17, 18 years. So I've written my monograph, my PhD on that, and then a number of articles and, and book chapters. And some of the most recent ones relate to, indeed, the, the chapter that I have as part of this seminar is on this particular point and uh, also the, the um, a chapter on the ICJ and the recognition of states. I think I'll leave it at that. And thank you so much for uh, such a detailed, um, I would say, um, expose on how the ICJ functions and how it has contributed in shaping uh, international law. Uh, we'd be very, very excited for you to uh, join us on our campus, especially when things are better. Um, your new joinees like Aparna and I, we are yet to see the campus and I think that'd be a wonderful opportunity to meet you in person and hold a session. So um, thank you once again to Ankit uh, and thank you once again to you for taking our time today. It's been wonderful hosting you today. Thanks a lot for your kind words, uh, Professor Tripathi. And uh, again, my most sincere thanks also to Mr. Malhotra and uh, Professor Popovsky and the Jindal Society of International Law for, for the kind invitation. It's been a pleasure to, to be with you. So thanks a lot again. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much, sir. Grateful. <laughs>